Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Let's go ahead and get started. Thank you for coming this evening. Well, I'd say, first of all, our uh, change from Saturdays to Mondays looks like it succeeded. And the change of venue from the Heritage Center to here looks like it may have succeeded. So thank you so much for coming this evening. For those of you who I don't know, my name is Ted Davis, and I have the honor of being the chairman of the Chamber of Commerce's uh, Governmental Affairs Committee. And we annually uh, sponsor this forum, and then there's a subsequent one at the end of the legislative session. So today's purpose is to hear from our local uh, representatives who uh, are here to tell us what's happening. Obviously, they are on, uh, what is it, turnover, right? Turnover. Uh, so turnaround, thank you. I can never remember that correctly. Anyway, so whatever the House did, they've turned it over to the Senate. What the Senate's done, they've turned it over to the House. And then when they go back next week, they continue for the rest of the session. So we'll ha ask them to come back and then give us a closing uh, update, uh, probably in around June time frame. Uh, the rules for today, uh, we're going to give each of the uh, legislators four minutes for an opening statement. What are they doing? Where do they see things going? But then we'll begin the Q&A. They'll each have two minutes to answer the question. I'll start off with uh, two questions. And then we'll take your questions. We ask that you either write them down through that five card, or if you have them written, give them to Kelly Butler right back there. Uh, timing, uh, it's my lovely wife, Denny, right up here. And she'll be keeping track of the, again, four minute introduction, and then two minutes per question. And then at the end, uh, we'll have a two minute closing. Uh, Tim Johnson has told me that he's gonna have to leave uh, early for another engagement at 6.30. So at that time, I'll let him give his closing statement before he uh, takes off. I also want to thank uh, my staff, uh, Kelly Butler and Jeanette uh, Laby, uh, for their tremendous support in coordinating all this. And to uh, Eric Price, who is our uh, videographer, our session is being taped, and it will be posted on uh, Facebook and on the Chamber's uh, website afterwards. Have I missed anything, gentlemen? You all set? All right, we're going to go with the Senate first, then we'll get the House in numerical order with Tim Johnson, Dave Bueller, and then Pat. Thanks, Ted. Thank you all for being here. Democracy is a participation sport, I believe, so this is fantastic. In my capacity as your Senator, it's truly an honor to represent you tonight, as uh, all throughout this whole year during the session. My name is Senator Jeff Pittman. And for those who don't know, I represent Leavenworth. I did represent Leavenworth as a two-time uh, representative uh, on my first, first time around, and now it's my first term as a senator. I'm blessed to be married to my wife, Holly Pittman, longtime Leavenworthian. And I have three kids, one still in the public school system here, and I work for, to provide for my family uh, in business and technology as a supply chain consultant. As I think about the journey I've been on here with you together, when I first assumed office, our state faced a financial crisis that was uh, of national proportions. Our inability to fund schools, retirement systems, and our highways threatened the very fabrics of our communities. And when elected, I was one of those that rolled up our sleeves, united in purpose, and charted a course for stability and prosperity. That weight was daunting. The responsibility to safeguard our citizens' well-being, to honor our veterans, and to ensure that every child had access to a quality education is a, is a big task. But through bipartisan efforts, we turned the tides. We made tough choices, prioritized fiscal responsibilities without compromising our core values. We've had the ability to increase and fully fund general education funding for five years. We've seen year over raises, year over raises for our local correction workers. And we've had money come in for our local roads and infrastructure, including a plan for upgrades to our Centennial Bridge. Our economic engine roared to life. Historic capital investments fuel growth, create jobs, and revitalize our community. And that's happening right here in Northeast Kansas, and I'm proud to be a part of it. Over the last six years, 
We've had about 18 billion, that's historic, in economic development, uh, 60,000 new jobs as these projects come about, and 1,000 new Echo Devo projects in the state of Kansas, many of those in our areas, including Panasonic, Urban Outfitters, and many others. Now we have choices to make, hard choices, choices that define us as a community and as a region. One path, there lies division, the marginalization of certain citizens, and attacks on many of our, in, our democratic institutions. We could restrict autonomy, undermine voting rights, and sow discord, but that's not the path I choose. I choose a path of unity, compassion, and progress. I seek to fund our education system adequately, including those of special education, ensuring that every child has a chance to thrive. I seek a compromise on taxes. We'll talk about that later. One that lifts working families, supports small businesses, and fuels our economy. I seek to build a society where we accept our neighbor's strengths instead of punishing their differences. <clears throat> Let's get to the topic of a hand, though. We do have a budget surplus. Much of that was created through the, because the federal government for three years did not require us to pay $1 billion each year for FMAP services that's related to can care. That was $3 billion of extra funding that was infused, and that's one-time money. We've seen revenues come in lower than expected over the last three months. That's uncertainty. We can walk into tax cuts, which I do support some, just not those that are being pushed currently by the House and Senate leadership. We'll talk a lot about that. My solutions are to address property tax. Property taxes are the things that I heard about in my election, not necessarily income taxes. I did my part. I introduced a constitutional amendment to limit the uh, valuation assessment by 4% each year, year over year. That gives us tax certainty. And I did my part in introducing a bill that would give us back our LAVTR money back to the city and county. We can get into these tax cuts. Um, it was vetoed. Uh, in my position as a Senate Budget Committee, I see the projections and I see what we can do and what we should do. Our, our legislature has taken to going down a path of social issues during this political year. We can do better here in Kansas and I look forward to your thoughts and questions tonight. Good evening, and I appreciate that you are all here because when I was teaching government, I kept talking to my students. I'd tell them, you've got to come out. You've got to listen. So I am Tim Johnson. I serve the 38th district, which starts at the river, comes all the way up here around part of Leavenworth, and I take a quarter corner of Kansas City, Kansas, over there in the Piper area. This is my fourth year. I feel it's probably been my most challenging year since I have been in Topeka because of the issues, because of now that with time in the House, expectations to get things done. Now, this is how I like to work on it. I have gone to all of the school districts. I have met with all the superintendents because we have to know what our districts want. That's critical. I've tried to meet with all of our government leaders, your city administrator for the city of Leavenworth, with the county commissioners here, same thing in, in uh, Baser where I uh, live. It's important that before we go to Topeka, we look at what your needs are. And we have filed a number of bills. Some of them were relatively small but they are still important to each of your governments. Now, I serve on the K-12 through Education Budget Committee. That is a big challenge, and we hear a lot of things about special education. A focus now with the Gannon decision and the courts out of it is we have to force the federal government to pay their fair share. They have it. If we had the federal money that had been promised, we would be at a level that our special education people could work better. So we've got to get that money in. I also serve on the Veterans and Military Committee. That has been a joy for me. I'm sorry that after the first two years I lost my cohorts from Leavenworth County. Unfortunately, this year some of the bills that we passed are not going to be coming through. And that bothers me that because the bills did not get called up political repercussions from the veto vote. That's very simple. But we still were able to get certain things done. One of those is the Hero Scholarship that is so critical to our veterans. I'm also on the uh, Welfare Committee. 
the Homeless Committee, and then the uh, Foster Care and Adoption Oversight Committee. And that is something that's very special to me because our children are a critical, critical issue. And there's going to be some real issues on child care this coming um, weeks. I want you to know I, I echo the bipartisanship. I don't care what side you are on. I know both sides care about our kids. Just because I don't always agree with the, the procedures, we have caring, loving people. But we're going to need to answer those questions as we look at what the governor's proposed and its cost and its cost impact on your taxes. So those are issues. But I want you to know we can do this if we remain calm and discuss those child care issues. I, sometimes I ask you to all pull out and look at your grandkids on your phone, pictures. There's nothing more important than that. But I do appreciate that you are here, and I look forward to answering some of your other questions. Thank you. That was pretty good, Tim. Ten seconds left. I don't know if I'll get to do that. My name is Dave Beeler. I am uh, the representative for the 40th District. And so I've taken an, uh, a cue from Ted. So my comments tonight are supposed to be how we summarize and see the current legislative session. We've got four minutes to do that. So first off, thanks, Ted. Thanks to the chamber. Um, and thank you all for being here. Uh, Jeff and I were actually up here talking nice night like tonight. Would everybody actually make it out? Uh, but I'm glad you're here. So... Um, the theme of where are we in the legislative session? So I'm looking at my notes. I think of this as like halftime in a football game. And I'll, I'll use a little bit the analogy of the maybe the tax bill that Republicans fought hard for, got vetoed. We failed to override the veto last week. So we're at the halftime point, And like any football team in any football game, what do you do? You go in the locker room and you assess where you are and you assess how much time you have left in the game. And then you put together a strategy to get to the finish line or the end of the game, which will be the end of the session. So although we weren't successful last week, um, we've got an opportunity to go back and, and address some things. Because we do agree um, that the state has too much money and that tax relief is needed. And I'll get to that um, more in a little bit. But then that's more for uh, more discussion. So for myself, I get my background, I'm on the Fed and State Committee. So the Fed and State Committee, I believe one of the chamber's priorities is supporting the microbrewery bill or changes to the microbrewery legislation. There is a bill in the Senate um, that we will get a chance to hear. So I do support that. Um, moving to my second committee. My second committee is Health and Human Services. And if I were to sum up the first half in Health and Human Services, there's two things. It is um, we're trying to I expand health care, mental, physical, otherwise. And we're also, we're also working to bring people into that workforce. So there are, there are two different components to that. That's a priority. And so, for example, last week we passed, I think it was House Bill 2669. It was called Mental Health Intervention Team, which takes a concept that's been in proviso since 2018. Leavenworth School District actually uses it. Um, and it brings together a liaison uh, it with school administrators and some of the uh, supports that, that children or students who need mental health services can actually uh, acquire. So this bill puts that in statute and takes it out of the proviso statute. That's just one example of, of what Health and Human Services is doing. Second committee, or the last committee is tax, and we're going to get into tax later. But as you can imagine, there's, there's more than just HB 2284. There's a whole lot of tax-related um, issues that will come up. And then, other than assigned committees, last year I was appointed to the interim committee on uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities and those with physical disabilities. There's 7,500 Kansans who are on those lists, many of them who've been on those lists for over 10 years. Um, one of the things that I'm working on, have been working on, I better hurry up, um, is to reduce that list and reduce the wait list. Uh, in terms of two other non-assigned, I'm on the Veterans Caucus and the Rural Caucus. I'll, I'll go right to the, the Veterans Caucus. As a veteran myself, I'm very passionate about veterans-related issues, whether it's tax and, and making this state more friendly to military retirees and those are here who are here on orders. And I believe we have a ways to go to do that. And there's a ton of bills out there. There is one thing I am proud of working on. Uh, those of you know, uh, retired, or pardon me, deceased Colonel Roger Don Donlan, the first Medal of Honor winner in the state. Uh, I am working with Mrs. Donlan to get a proclamation from the state 
for his celebration of life ceremony on the 10th of April at Fort Leavenworth. So again, that's that's what I do. I'm glad to be here tonight. Um, look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you. It's planned. The other one I have, I just got last week. So uh, thank you, Ted. Thank you, Jen. Thank you to the chamber for uh, hosting this tonight. And thank you, everybody, for coming out. I'm Pat Proctor. I serve the people of Leavenworth, Fort Leavenworth, and Kickapoo uh, as your representative in the State House. And uh, I've been, I'm beginning my fourth year in the House. And uh, you might be asking, what have I been doing for those four years? Well, I'm glad you asked, I'm going to tell you. So um, first thing, I've, I've been fighting to lower our property taxes. Um, I voted for uh, the tax package, and I voted to override the veto on the tax, pack tax package in part because it more than doubled the property valuation exemption from 42000 to 100000 of your property value was going to be exempted from the state property tax. Um, I've also been the loudest voice in support of uh, moving the constitutional amendment by Senator Karen Tyson that would cap our property values at 4%. Uh, that passed the Senate and getting that passed in the House. I've also been fighting to keep your family safe. Uh, the border crisis has made every state a border state, and fentanyl is flooding our streets, and I hope we're going to get a chance to talk about that more. So I sponsored a resolution, got 60 co-sponsors, and passed it across the floor of the House overwhelmingly to uh, make it clear that Kansas stands with Texas in its fight to secure our southern border and asking the governor to do anything that Governor Abbott needs up to and including uh, providing National Guard troops to secure our southern border. I've also, I also co-sponsored and passed an expansion of the Good Samaritan laws here in Kansas to also cover fentanyl overdose so that if, some, if somebody's overdosing, the people around them will call 911 and get them help instead of you know, running away and leaving them to die. And I also voted to expand drug education, something that a good friend of mine, Andy Burris, uh, ran for this, uh, the school board in Lansing to try to do. I'm trying to do that across the entire state. And uh, uh, Representative Beeler and uh, uh, Andy Burris have been loud voices in getting that done. I've also stood with veterans and uh, corrections officers. I don't know if you heard on the news, but there was a riot at Lansing Correctional Facility this weekend. There are two corrections officers in the hospital. I talked to uh, Secretary Zamuda today. We're going to try to meet later this week, and I'm going to bring to him the concerns of the corrections officers. I've also been fighting to get them better retirement and better pay so that they have more people on the job to secure each other and to secure us. And finally, uh, I, uh, uh, in this fight, I've been fighting for disabled veteran property tax relief. It's for the veterans that are here now, but it's also for those 3,500 service members that are separating every year from Kansas and going to Florida and Texas. We have 85,000 empty jobs, and we need those veterans here filling jobs and growing our economy. And finally, I've been uh, laser focused on bringing jobs and opportunity back to Leavenworth. Uh, last, last term, I passed the historic Kansas Act. Is a good idea from uh, one of the residents here in Leavenworth. I got that passed um, to uh, incentivize investment in our historic downtown. I also, uh, this session, uh, supported and voted for the, um, the bill that would uh, make it free for spouses of uh, service members and for veterans to transfer their licenses to Kansas. A couple years ago, I was one of the co-sponsors for the bill that made that easier. Now we're going to make it free so that we can get those folks uh, uh, staying here, growing our economy. It's an honor to serve you as your state representative and to fight for you in Topeka. Thank you for being here tonight. All right. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, why don't we go in reverse order? So, Pat, if you want to come back to the podium, we'll let you be the first up. Uh, first question, as you know, gentlemen, uh, the chamber has two priorities. One has to do with uh, tax legislation and the second one with uh, transportation infrastructure. So my first question is, uh, you know, recent reports suggest that the Republican House will not be able to put a tax bill together before the end of session. So what is happening? What will happen? And will you have to go into special session to get a tax bill together? Well, Ted, we're not leaving Topeka without a tax bill, even if I got to bar the doors. Um, I, what I heard over and over again last year when I was out campaigning for local candidates to try to reduce our property taxes here locally um, is that 
property taxes are out of control. The number of people that I met that are uh, being priced out of their house, that are paying more for a mortgage now than they used to pay, or more for property taxes now than they used to pay for their mortgage. It's unsustainable. Um, this was a great tax package, and I know you're going to hear, uh, you know, it's a tax cut for the rich. Well, you know what? The Koch brothers don't live in my district. Let me tell you who does live in my district. The uh, median income in our district is 58000 but if you take out Fort Leavenworth, who doesn't pay income taxes in the state of Kansas because they're too darn high, the median income in my district is about 40000 and this tax bill would have been huge for them. If you made $25,000 a year, you got a bigger tax cut in real dollars than somebody that made $150,000. It's 400 bucks. And if you make 25,000 a year, 400 bucks is a car payment. 400 bucks is putting food on your table for a couple months. I mean, that's a big deal if you're a lower income uh, Kansan. Um, I talked about the standard exemption that was in that tax package. Um, food sales tax, which also disproportionately benefits lower income Kansans. We were going to take it to zero in July instead of in, uh, in 2025. Um, no tax on social security. Uh, you know, doing away with that cliff where when you made $75,001, suddenly you're paying another $1,000 in taxes. These are not tax cuts for the rich folks. These are tax, but, fo tax cuts for the folks in our district. And I'm not going to let us leave until we get it done. Thank you. Dave, would you go next? Dave. All right. Um, you know, a little bit like Representative Proctor said, I can guarantee the number one issue that I heard about last year and even two years ago on the campaign was tax. Property tax being number one, but just the state of ta overall taxation in the state of Kansas. Last year, the House Taxation Committee put together a tax plan that consisted of about six things and was total sustainable tax relief, about $500 million. And so that was a threshold we agreed to in committee. So when we put that tax plan together, a little echo here, um, it became the foundation for this year's plan. So what was in this plan? We were going to eliminate taxes on Social Security income. We were going to repeal the Kansas State food sales tax. That would have happened on April the 1st. We were going to provide real property tax relief. We were going to reduce the banking privilege tax. We were going to increase the standard index standard deductions on income tax and, and index them with inflation. And then the biggest thing, and this is the sticking point, was the single tax rate of 5.25%, which if you look at two blue states around us, Colorado and Illinois, they both have the same thing and it's lower, it's like 4.7%. So that's the difference in the tax plan. I believe that we can sustain about $500 million in tax relief. That is the, the assumption that we're working on in the House and the House Tax Committee. And while the governor vetoed our bill and we fell three votes short, we're going to take the elements, some of those elements, and we're going to come back with, with tax relief because it's more than just, there's more than just homeowners. There, there, there are people who don't own homes that deserve a tax break. And we can get there through income tax. We can get through through a variety of other means. And we can do that in a sustainable fashion. Um, I guess, again, I would say this. The bottom line is Kansans deserve a tax break. There's money out there, money on the table, and we're going to go get it for them. Thank you. Thank you. So it's halftime. Are we down 10 points? <laughs> uh, maybe a little more. The tax issue for me was the one issue that has to be done. It has to be done. We cannot leave in any way, shape, or form until you have a fair tax break. But it's not going to be just the one bill. The bill that got vetoed was a single major bill, and they've discussed it very well. I agree with them on everything. But there's about four or five other smaller bills that a lot of times you don't hear about. One of them, our county commissioners here brought to my attention last year. A simple thing like having to have competitive bids by your rural water districts who were running up bids and therefore you in Leavenworth County were footing the bill for that. That meant they had less money for their um, road and bridge projects. That's a little thing, but it adds up. There were several other bills that are sitting out there waiting to be passed and each one of those when we put them together will help make the difference. 
I'm not quite sure what the final package will be. I'm not, it's above my pay grade. But I do know that until that happens, there's going to be some chipping away at some of the funding of the governor's money in her budget. If you don't want it, then we're going to take away some of this money so that therefore the taxes will not be going up. Good or bad, but that's one of the things that's going to happen. So I'm not going home either and bringing two five fours and some nails. Thank you. So we do need tax cuts. I told the governor we need tax cuts. This was not the right plan. This plan was produced by a special interest who wanted a very big income bracket change for the most wealthy. And we have working folks around here that deserve the break too. I heard the numbers presented. Let's just talk about what a flat tax rate does. It raises that bottom rate up from 3.1 to 5.25. It raises the middle one up from 5.1 Five up to 5.25, so it's a raising of the rates. And then it drops that top one from 5.75 to 5.25, that one that we're talking about the most wealthy. Now, okay, that drops the, the income off of the taxes for the wealthy. How do we get to the numbers that are being proposed? Similar things that I support, increasing that standard deduction. Those exemptions are what help those lowest income earners. I support getting rid of that social security tax. It's in the plan that was proposed by Republicans and Democrats, including the governor. I support that. Almost everything in this bill is a good thing, except for that flat tax. And here's some other numbers I had run. If I was making 42,000 as a couple, I saved 75 cents. 75 cents, what does that buy, a bag of chips? If I'm making $70,000, how much do I save? 75 cents. If I'm making 100,000, I save about $125, which we start getting into money. If I make $5 million, I save nearly $22,000. So I ask you, you know, we do have median incomes that are a little lower than Johnson County. Those median income earners, when they go from 40 to 70, shouldn't they be saving more money? I believe so. And I think that's what we really need to hold out for. If we don't pass a tax plan, as has been proposed by some of our highest in the leadership quadrants that will just leave, the governor has the power to bring us back. And she has said, we will have a special session and we will have tax break, tax breaks and I support that fully. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Gentlemen, our second question. Uh, the chamber endorses the priorities uh, for progress, which lists about seven or eight uh, projects for transportation infrastructure improvements in the, the uh, state. So my question is, what are you doing what's to advance these improvements throughout Leavenworth County? And how likely are your efforts to succeed? Dave, would you start? Yeah, so uh, before this session began, um, I think I met with almost every one of the Leavenworth County Commissioners individually. We met with them uh, in November. Um, I met with Tim Vandal of City Lansing, Paul Kramer from Leavenworth and talked about the, their infrastructure needs. Also attended the uh, Lansing City Council meeting I was last August or September where uh, the priorities and for the, the plan for K-5 improvement was discussed. So if you go to, if you Google K.Ike, that's where you can find what the infrastructure uh, projects are statewide. You can also look at the Northeast Corridor. Um, it's a great resource. So getting the, getting the input from our, our local government uh, and, and those in terms of what their priorities are. Second thing for me to do was to go and talk to uh, Joel Skelly. He's the director of policy at KDOT, just to make sure that I know where these projects align at the state level and how they're going to uh, ultimately, how they're going to rack and stack. And that's the biggest challenge with this is if you look at that KDOT Ike list or if you go to the Progress for Priority, uh, Progress for Priorities website, you'll find all those projects out there. And I would just say this, we have to temper um, to some degree our optimism with the reality of, of large scale production. The Centennial Bridge, for example, uh, approved, I don't know how many years ago, isn't scheduled for construction to start until 20, 2027 and completion 2029. So that is the reality of, a pro of projects of this scale. The main thing for us is to stay engaged and to make sure that 
our priorities are aligned, they're aligned at the local and regional level, and that we funnel those up through the Mid-America Regional Council, Kansas Department of Transportation, and the U.S. Department of Transportation. That's the way we stay with skin in the game, and that's how we make sure that we're uh, in the game for those, those types of infrastructure improvements because we need them. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go next. Well, I concur. I mean, one of the best things we can do as a state government is to work closely with our, our local governments, as I have, building those relationships with the county, building them with the city. I feel like sometimes, however, at the state level in the legislature, we have demonized some of the, in the last few years local government in such a way that it makes it more difficult for us to work together. My own priority is to build those relationships, understand the differences, and understand how we can come together. And with that, we can build plans that when we can align our locals with the uh, county, with the state, with the feds, all of a sudden those things with our support come into reality. When we can align those plans with our development plan, say at the, at the county level, build out the strategic map and say this supports the strategic quality that we can attract that money. Now I've heard actually on that bridge, we might be delayed till 2029 to start because MDOT is sitting there having a delay on their funding. And that's unfortunate, but we still need to work towards it, assuming that's the plan, continue to priority, prioritize our, our local governments. One of the other things inside of your priority list as a chamber, though, is to bring back that LAVTR, bring back that money that uh, the state's keeping and has kept for 20 years that can come back and support local government. It's almost $130 million. I've got a bill out there. It's gotten lots of support across all the different counties. I think that's important for us locally to continue to reduce the pressure on property taxes. And, uh, and honestly, when we look at our growth in this region, uh, I couldn't be more happy, but we have to address that property tax issue. We're growing, so that means our values are going up. We need certainty, and that's why I sponsored that SCR 1604 that turned into that 1611 that passed the Senate. I find it very, very important to support the LAVTUR return, as well as that con consistency of property tax to help support our region and to build those strategic plans uh, with the transportation departments and align ourselves with local government. Thank you. Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'm not on any of the transportation committees. I'm not on any of the budget committees for transportation. And I couldn't even get the state to come and fix that pothole out in front of my house there on K7. We, we think there's a Volkswagen down in there somewhere, but um, they did put up orange cones for us. I say that kind of as a joke, but these road projects are set up years and years ahead. One of the things that I, I feel very good about in working with Senator Pittman in the Wyandotte County area is the K7 corridor is truly my, my domain. I'm on right on it. And we've had some conversations, and we've both been over to some events in Wyandotte County recently, including the, uh, the new arena for American Royal, just an awesome place. And as we see the development there, K7 is that business corridor that we all need. I was extremely disappointed when the governor chose to put the, veterans, the new veterans home in Topeka. I felt it belonged here. I, I didn't care which side of the line we had land. Wyandotte County had worked with us. Leavenworth would have had it, would have been with our VA. But yes, we've got it. In a few years, it'll be up and running. That would have been kind of a jewel that I think we could have added. And I always, I did appreciate because Senator Pittman helped us get that particular bill. Um, I think it's going to be difficult for funding this year as we look at the budget if we're going to cut taxes. So for some of these improvements, it might take a little bit of time. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm a, I'm a Republican, fair disclosure, and uh, I don't like to pick winners and losers. Um, you know, it, on principle, I think the market should decide. But you know what? Uh, people can't eat principles, and people can't pay their bills with party platforms. And so when uh, Panasonic, uh, was looking for a place to locate, and uh, we were presented with an incentive package that would have brought them here, I voted for it. I voted for it because it was I had promised you when I was running to serve you that I was going to bring jobs and opportunity back to Leavenworth, 
and there were 4,000 jobs going to go in at the, uh, in DeSoto right across the river from Leavenworth County. And with that money comes infrastructure money, right? Money to uh, improve the electric, the electric infrastructure, uh, money to improve the transportation infrastructure. I'm on the transportation committee. I'm on the utilities committee. And I'm holding people's feet to the fire to make sure that the, the dollars that we allocated to that project go there. But this is going to be huge for Leavenworth. Um, it's not just the 4,000 jobs. You know, we went out there to see them putting up that building, and it's going up at lightning speed. I mean, I encourage everybody to take a drive out there and just see how fast it's going up. They want to reshore suppliers because they don't want to be dependent on China anymore. So they want to reshore suppliers here in the United States. That's another 4,000 jobs. They told us that they want to do another plant here in Kansas. I want it here. I want it here. And so we've got to make sure that we get this infrastructure uh, built and get this infrastructure improved. I fought, uh, you know, me and Lance Neely in our first term, we were uh, KDOT's la worst nightmare. Every bill they brought, we tacked something onto or we, uh, we argued against on the floor or we tried to amend it in committee until we could get a commitment and get the bridge finally after years of promises onto the funded list. Um, we're doing the improvements on K-7, but we got to do more and I'm fighting to get that investment here in our county. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, everyone that's participated for all these questions you've submitted. Uh, we've sorted them, and I have two questions, gentlemen, uh, concerning Medicare. So the questions are, what is your stance on Medicare expansion? What is the hold, Medicaid, I'm sorry, Medicaid, Medicaid expansion. Uh, what is the holdup when all uh, the other surrounding states have, uh, have it in them already? And uh, how might you, we get Medicaid, Medicare? Uh, for Kansas, uh, is there federal funding to help with that? Tim, would you start us? I've been very clear on I will not vote yes for Medicaid expansion in Kansas right now. I don't believe that after examining for the last three years what it entails, that there is a cost there that is far more than what many of you realize. A lot of the components appear wonderful. Federal money, oh sure, but then it goes away. We pay that. We also know that there will be those that will benefit from this that choose not to work at all. They simply do not want to have a job and they are the ones that will be entitled to this particular type of medical benefit. I think there are other ways. One of those that I'm working on right now with Senator Marshall's office is cutting the cost of prescription drugs. We can't do it at the state level, but we can do it at the federal level. Right now, your local local uh, pharmacies are facing one of their biggest crises ever because of the great control that Big Pharma has over them. My local pharmacy in Baser is just toeing the line, they're just hanging in there because of the way that the drugs work. This particular bill, and I've come out um, in an editorial, we need this to control those managers, those companies that are owned by different institutions with great, great assets and great lobbying. I think that is one of the ways that we can help. As a senior, my medicine is very expensive. I didn't think I was going to be this bad off when I got older, but it is there. I have one particular medicine that's been very helpful. It, my pharmacist doesn't even get paid the full value of it under the, the current regulations. How can she give me medicine and lose money? So that is another area. Thank you. Okay. Sounds great, right? Free health care. Everybody's going to get free health care. Um, this Medicaid expansion does not do what you're being told that it does. What it does is it puts hundreds of thousands of able-bodied working age adults on the government health care and in many cases takes them off of private health care because once they qualify, their companies are going to stop offering that health care. So it'll put them all in line ahead of all the people the elderly, the disabled, the young children that currently qualify for, for uh, Medicaid. 
We just saw a couple weeks ago in the Topeka Capital Journal an article that says that disabled kids, developmentally disabled kids, are waiting 10 years for Medicaid benefits. How much longer are they going to have to wait if we expand Medicaid and we put a bunch of, of uh, working age adults on? You're going to hear the, that the governor in the new proposal put work requirements on, so all those people are going to have to work. Well, the Biden administration has struck down every single work requirement that's been put on any state on Medicaid. So there isn't going to be a work requirement. And, you know, I ran the first time I told you that I was running because we have a big population in my district of folks that are trapped in the, the slavery of generational poverty. They're, they're trapped in the program. I've been fighting up there to try to do things like add job training as a requirement to get food stamps so that they can get better skills, so that they'll be qualified to, grow their, to get jobs that grow their lives and grow them out of dependency. Why? Why would we put another chain on these people's backs? I'm not going to do it. I'm just not going to do it. Thank you. Great. So I would, I would challenge anybody in this room to do this. Go out and Google every state that has passed some form of Medicaid expansion and, and, and find out the answers to these three questions. What happened to the projected number of enrollees? It's usually 2x the factor that was originally projected. Second thing is the cost. That's usually about 2x as well. Okay, and then the third thing is go out and look at what happens to the size of the workforce in each of those states. You'll find that it contracts by somewhere between 7 to 11 percent. So if the number of enrollees for Medicaid expansion would go from the projected 150,000 to 200 to 250,000, and if the cost would go up to somewhere between two and $300 million annually, and then the workforce contracted by 11%, is that a good deal? I don't think so. We're struggling to find enough people to fill the, the available jobs that are out there. So, but don't take my word, I challenge you, please do that, because you won't get past this rhetoric unless you find out the answers to those questions. You won't find one single state where those three things haven't happened. So and the other thing I would challenge you, or, or maybe talk about is a little bit what, what Pat mentioned. 7,500 people in this state who are on the uh, intellectual or developmentally disabled or physically disabled list. I know of one personally that went on the list in June or July of 2013 and just found that they were eligible for services in December of last year, 10 years. That is wrong. Let's put our, our time and money working on that. And then the second thing I would say, we can, come, we can find common ground. We can find common ground on something like Medicaid reform instead of Medicaid expansion. Let's look at reimbursement rates to doctors and hospitals, and we'll find that we can get much closer than going out and, and putting in a, a, a ginormous new government package. Thank you. Well, I guess you guys know I'm, I'm in stark contrast to the prior speakers here. I believe that uh, some of those facts are a little misguided. Uh, we can find lots of places where this was not the case. In fact, if we had more people enrolling, it means that there are more people in need. If we think about the average median income here, 40000 per, per per person, this is a workforce development. We have folks, small businesses that support this, the Sheriff's Association that supports this. These people will work in small businesses and not go to the big companies for insurance needs. We're talking about the lowest of lowest income earners out there. We talk about the number of rural hospitals that have closed, eight rural hospitals that have closed that this would help. We're talking about $7 billion that this state has paid off because we want to support New York and California on their Medicaid expansion, but not take advantage of that ourselves. $7 billion, that's a, that's a crying shame right there. If we think about um, the, the states that you go out and look at, look at this stat. Those states that don't expand Medicaid, three times a higher insurance premiums for everybody else. If we want to talk about um, support, polls have consistently come back that 70% of Kansans, regardless of party, support this. In fact, let me tell you about the budget this year. I might happen to be on the budget. Great position, great for our county. Right now, we, we, my colleagues up there 
will have to pay $62 million more than the governor, governor's proposing to get $790 million of benefit. So we actually save $62 million by expanding Medicaid. We get $790 million in all funds this year if we expand, and their proposition is to increase the Medicaid, or Medicaid rates by $30 million and not affect anybody new. We're losing money hand over fist by not doing this. We're paying for everybody else's health care just due to stubbornness, and uh, I do support Medicaid expansion at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, this is going to be a bold shift uh, to um, a local issue. It has to do with home rule. So the questioner asks, says, I don't understand home rule. Why can cities and counties be trusted to decide whether to sell explosive fireworks, but not trusted to decide what, uh, whatever to regulate plastic bags or, sty or styrofoam? Will I take that on? <laughs> yeah, please. So I, was, I think in the early 1960s when the concept of home rule was actually codified in the state, but essentially what it, what it allows is for cities and municipalities, local government to, to make those decisions, and the state should stay out of it. Um, there are certain times where you have to weigh, um, you know, the, the, you have to weigh the overall benefit, and, and perhaps this was establishing a larger direction for the state makes sense. Now, I use the plastic bag ordinance as a good one because that one came up last year and it was from Douglas County. And if you look at any city that does that and you, and you start talking to real businesses, the owners, the, the people of convenience stores and restaurants, and, you, and they were not going to be able to use uh, plastic bags and then uh, straws and other styrofoam kind of things, their costs were going to go up. Um, I, I forget what Representative Adam Thomas said um, the cost of, of, of disposable uh, uh, products in his restaurant, we're going to go by a factor of 10. That hits the consumer, um, whether or not you want it or not. So there are times when, and I can tell you from my, my previous life uh, in supply chain experience, a state like California is a prime example of where uh, the California Air Resource Boards put all these crazy regulations together. Anybody who supplies products to those states then has to increase costs in their own products just to meet the demands of that state. So the concept of home rule, uh, we do try to um, honor that when we can. But there are times when you have to look at the greater good for the state. The plastic bags is an issue. Uh, fireworks came up this year. So and it, it's, it's going to be one of those things that occasionally comes up. But I will tell you, I do support the concept of home rule. There are just times when uh, you got to stop people from sticking themselves in the eye. Thank you. So my wife and I, uh, we own a restaurant. We own two restaurants, one in Leavenworth and one in uh, Manhattan. My beautiful wife's sitting back there. She uh, doesn't make it to a lot of things, so thank you for being here. Um, she's, she's the one that pays all the bills while I'm off in Topeka, so that's why she's not a lot of stuff. Um, we used to have a restaurant in Lawrence. We ended up closing the restaurant because I couldn't find anybody to work because of the workforce issues. But before we left, in the middle of COVID, after they had shut us down for six months and were, uh, you know, putting all these ridiculous restrictions on us, Lawrence wanted to make it illegal to use natural gas in restaurants. All our stoves, all our ovens, all our grills would have suddenly been illegal and we would have, had, we would have shut down. I mean, we would have shut down. I mean, we ended up shutting down anyways, but we were still making it, you know, we were still, we still had enough people to run the restaurant at that point. We would have, we would have shut down five jobs gone forever. Uh, another thing they wanted to do was they wanted to do away with styrofoam containers and uh, go to environmentally friendly cardboard or something. I don't know why cardboard's more environmentally friendly than styrofoam, but that's what they said, right? Um, that, you know, that adds up when the city's telling you you can only do takeout, and now they're telling you you have to go buy containers that are twice or three times as expensive. Your government has a responsibility to protect your rights, and there's nothing more fundamental. They put it right in the Declaration of Independence, your inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And if a, if a, a municipality, a county, or the state 
or the federal government is treading on those fundamental rights, your government owes it to you to protect those God-given rights. Thanks. Yes, I do believe in local government making decisions. I was a school board member down in Piper years ago. I always wanted to have views and ideas that express what that district. It's not the same here in Leavenworth and Wyandotte County as it is out far west. But here's one of the problems. On occasion, some of the local governmental bodies make very poor decisions that impact the people down the chain. And one of those was the Bill 2493 that all four legislators in Le Leavenworth County supported for our county commissioners, the simple use of competitive bids by rural water districts when it impacted the county, projects for the county. We know for a fact, because of the cost analysis, that many of the projects that you're paying for when they move water lines were being highly priced without any competitive bids. Every other governmental agency has to do that, but not rural water districts. Unfortunately, that bill did not come up this uh, session. As of last Friday, it is on hold, but it's not dead. I'm going to tell you, nothing's ever dead in Topeka if I have to come back next year. Why wouldn't they want competitive bids? Here's another one. Your local government, and I'd like to thank Mr. Davis for bringing this to my attention several months ago, was your microbrewery in this town. A lovely business, striving to create enterprise and serve product. He's done a great business, but he can't do that under current laws. Well, why can't the city of Leavenworth fix that? Because of state law. So we need to modify it. There are times that local governments can't get it done, and we have to go to the state level to enforce those good, good ideas. Thank you. Thank you. It's a funny thing when your wife is sitting commissioner, all of a sudden local government becomes very, very important in your life. And that's happened to me. Um, you know, it's an odd, I, I mentioned it before when we were talking about returning LAVTR. That's money that the state takes away from our localities and keeps in the whole agreement for years and years uh, was to give that money back to the local governments. Well, the argument is local governments will create a slush fund. Local governments aren't responsible with their money. That's the narrative. That's what people actually say on the floor and inside of these meetings. You probably heard them locally even. You know, we've capped the ability of local governments to either uh, put in bonds or put in um, sales tax increases if they feel it or even decreases sometimes. We've got a bill out there, uh, HB 2700, which would have a central committee of state people looking at all our books and media to see what their properness is for our school boards and not allow our school boards necessarily have that control. We won't allow Wyandotte County to have prevailing wage even though they want it. Paying the workers and the unions that what they feel they need to or even those local, those local folks. We dictate a lot of things and we give mandates about whether they're going to be revenue neutral and what they have to do and how much money they have to spend to notify us. There's a lot of animosity amongst the leading parties, amongst the leadership in our local governments. And I believe our local governments are the closest to us. They understand the best about what this individual community needs working with their county partners. And they should be allowed to make the decision they can. It's not always us at the state level who knows best what everybody should do. And so I, I do support local control in ever more ways than I ever did before. Thank you. Thank you. All right, gentlemen, thank you so much. Uh, we're gonna change uh, directions again. This has to do with uh, transgender issues. Uh, three people have written questions. Let me read all of them and you can kind of answer it with one. So the first person asked, should biological men be allowed to compete against biological women in sports in Kansas? Another asks, last year Republicans passed a bill to protect women from three transgender girls in high school sports out of a total number of 106,000 high school athletes. I thought the Republicans didn't like big government. Was it necessary to make a law that protected citizens from three girls? And finally, 
<clears throat> from the Industrial Revolution to Jim Crow to the Women's Lib and today's legislation against trans people, politicians have used public safety regarding restroom as weapons to control and restrict Americans to curtail cur cur the civil rights of our citizens. Do you have any historical facts to back up that this uh, fear mongering was something good for, is something good for America? Tim, if you go first, and then I'll let you also give your closing comments since we want to get out. <clears throat> I come at this with a very unique perspective, and I spoke about this a couple of weeks ago. I was blessed with the ability to coach women's powerlifting in Baser Linwood High School. And I will tell you that is the most successful women's powerlifting team, high school team in the United States, period. They just won another state championship. I am so proud of what we started 15 years ago. And one of the things that I do know as a coach is that there are differences. There are biological differences, chromosomes on one of the issues with the transgender is that they are then provided steroids, which enhances lifting. Why would I allow someone to have enhanced materials in their body to compete against those women? There is a difference. Now, do I care? I'm all for a tournament for the, if the transgenders want to lift with, with males, that's fine. It's fine. The restroom issue. I, I do not want a transgender who is not truly a female in the restroom with my granddaughter. And, but should we have neutral restrooms? Okay, Baser Linwood High School Sports Complex, go in there. Every one of those restrooms is independent. There's your problem, it's all gone, not even an issue. Can we solve that issue without, it's very interesting that we make it such a strong position, but we have to deal with that in our own hearts. And so I share how I believe, and that's that's just all it is. Did, did you want yeah. me to go ahead real quick? Yeah, go ahead and give your departure. Folks, we've had some things happen in Topeka because of the veto that I'm very disappointed with. Some of our veterans bills did not pass. Didn't get called up because certain people didn't vote the way they were supposed to vote. I'm sorry for that because our veterans deserve better. We got a couple of them. I hope maybe we can alleviate that problem. Uh, I am very pleased that we did get past an upgrade in the Harrow Scholarship. That is something that Susan Estes from Wichita and myself passed two years ago. For those people who gave the ultimate sacrifice and we then included public safety, police, fire, and EMS, if you're disabled at 80%, I have two sons, both. 80% disabled from combat wounds in Afghanistan. It provides scholarships, and it was so neat the day that my son, grandson was looking at scholars. He said, Grandpa, what's this hero scholarship? And I said, for people who gave a great sacrifice to this country. And we upgraded it, the Regent Scholars uh, money, and made some changes that's even better. And please share that, if you're a veteran, we changed the date. It used to say, the first two years, it was 9-11. No, it goes all the way back. So if you're a veteran, please talk to your VSO. If you're disabled, would this be there for you and your family, your spouse? That is an important, important bill. Uh, I pledge my heart to the child care issues. And I hope that we will again Look to those issues carefully with love and not anger because what we do for those kids in child care in the next one to two years will make a difference for your jobs but also for those children and also for our early learning. Those are critical. And I thank you so much and I'm sorry that I have to leave but I have a very important church meeting tonight talking, spending money. Thank you. Thank you. Continuing on with the transgender issue, uh, David, you go next. Uh, you know, sometimes I uh, can't believe we're actually having this discussion. And it's not because I have anything against anybody who's transgender or LGBTQ. 
Part of it's because I'm a dad and I'm a grandfather. I've got two sons and one daughter. And I think back to when my daughter was coming up, especially in middle school in those years, and it doesn't matter if it's three or 300 or 3,000. My daughter and my two granddaughters should have the right to privacy in their own restroom, their own locker room, and they should be competing against females. That's the way it is. And I, I, I don't want to appear hard-hearted to that, but that's, I mean, seriously, that's just the way it is. So, and, it, and it's, you know, it's not a civil rights issue. I just, I, I think if you, if you do look at, at surveys in this one, you'll find that most of America agrees with that. All you have to do is, is look at Leah Thomas and look at some of the actual real injuries that are happening to high school athletes across the, this country to see what happens when you have a biological male tri participating uh, against biological females, particularly at the high school level. So again, um, I'm just, I'm shocked sometimes we have this conversation. We shouldn't be having it. Thank you. Okay. So this is a free country, and you have the right to believe whatever it is you want to believe, okay? And if you're 18 and you're uh, born male, but you believe you're a female, you know what? More power to you. That's between you and your God. I really have no say in that. But whether it's, you know, what you do on your own property or what you do when you're driving your car, your rights end where everybody else's rights begin. It is so interesting that the people that are so fast to bring up the so-called separation of church and state demand that we all comply with their worldview. We all use the pronouns that they want used. That we ignore what we believe and allow men to compete in women's sports destroy competition, destroy Title IX that women fought for a generation to get. And your rights also end when it comes to the safety of our kids. If that child turns 18 and they want to transition socially or transition medically, more power to them. But if you're going to permanently sterilize a child with drugs, or you're going to mutilate a child so that they can never have children or they can never breastfeed, that's where it is society's responsibility to step in. Certainly is a political issue, isn't it? We asked the question, it was like... Uh, Okay, please, survey please, says please, please. survey says it is and it isn't, I guess, in the audience here. I find it to be a very, very politically divisive issue, one put out here on purpose to divide us. We have, we have, uh, yeah, exactly, yeah, I bet you wouldn't. Um, we, have lot, we have rules in place for this type of thing in the Kansas. We had rules in place for competitive sports. We have rules in place for college. The laws that we passed were punitive. They were a broad stroke for everybody. Um, they went down to the youngest of our children and said, you, you can't compete in the same sports. Um, and then when, when it started, they were looking at their genitalia. It was so extreme. There are, this is an issue that's going to continue in our society. We have ways of working through this. We should be aware and cognizant of the differences of our children, understand that they have mental impact and social impact when we do broad stroke uh, legislation like that, it's punitive on, on so many, and uh, I'm, I'm sad that we're using such broad strokes to deal with such uh, a challenging issue in our society that will continue. Thanks. All right. Thank you. All right, let's stay on other hot topics. Next topic is uh, about abortion. Two different questions here. Uh, when do you believe life begins? Should we stop uh, funding, I think it is, abortion? And then the second one is, why is the question about women's rights to make a decision about their own bodies repeatedly brought up in our state's legislation and brought up with confusing words 
uh, so as to confuse voters. Pat, would you start? So I, I'm pro-life, and I believe that life begins at conception. But this is currently an issue that we're not able to legislate on. I was disappointed, but the uh, people of Kansas made the decision that they did not want the legislature to have the right to regulate abortion, so we're not able to legislate on this issue. So I'm focused on the things that we can legislate on. I'm focused on lowering your property taxes. I'm focused on uh, standing with our veterans. I'm focused on bringing jobs and opportunity back to Leavenworth because those are the things where we can make a difference right now. I hope that at some point the, the heart of Kansas will move, that the people will make a different decision, and we will be able to put common sense regulations in place to protect mothers and children, but that's not where we're at right now, so we're just not able to legislate on this issue. Thank you. Dave? So like, so like Pat, I'm, I'm, I'm pro-life, but I also respect the decision that was made in August of whatever it was, 20, whenever it was, we passed the value of them both. I mean, that, the voters clearly spoke. Um, my view and what I support and what I work on, in particularly in health and human services, is uh, we had a compa uh, Pregnancy Compassion Act, or we're working to, to fund pregnancy resource centers. And this is one of those issues, it's, it's maybe a little bit like the transgender issue, that until we take the left and the right, and we start trying to find some common ground in the middle, all we're going to have is all this, this yakking at each other. So I recognize the fact that the voters spoke very loudly on August, August 2nd, uh, whenever that was. But I think also we have to look at, at places like in this state, there are 57 pregnancy resource centers that the other side wants to come out of the woodwork and just bedevil and beguile them. And for example, I think it was two weeks ago, House Bill 2789. We had a Planned Parenthood group come up and, and talk about pregnancy resource centers that were contributing to systemic racism, that the, the people that owned and managed those things were taking lavish vacations. They were spreading all this rhetoric and this stuff out there to villainize a group that's trying to help women as they're making choices to either carry a pregnancy or what they'll need after, after they do become pregnant. We need to figure out a way to get away from the left and away from the right and start talking to each other about this issue. Because until we do, all it's going to be is this yakking going on back and forth. And I would, I would encourage you to do this. Patty Howley runs the Sparrow Women's Clinic in Lansing. Call her. Ask her what she does. Ask her if anybody in that resource center draws a single dime for what they do. Ask them where their equipment came from. That's, that's being pro-life. That's taking care of women in, their, in those in those parts of their life. Do that, and maybe we can come a little bit closer to the center on this issue. Thank you. Um, it is a spectrum. I, I'd say it's left, less left and right and more spectrum of beliefs and spectrum of what we're willing to accept when the government gets involved in our decisions. Um, Value Them Both did pass in August of 2022. It's, I mean, it passed the House and Senate, and then it went to the constitutional choice of the people, and then it failed. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, we have plenty of issues to address. We have property taxes. I think Representative Proctor hit it well. Growing our tax base, educating our kids, providing health care, and helping them people have the lives that they deserve. There are bills out there still proposed just in the last few weeks. I think it's uh, SB 425, which should allow pregnant women to claim child support starting at the date of conception. Um, we just heard about the in, in, in vitro fertilization down in Alabama. These are all kinds of bills. There's one about having an ultrasound before you can have uh, this, this, this operation. And a lot of these are meant to, some people feel help, but sometimes they actually hurt the process and are, are ways to slow down when folks want to actually control their health care they're putting hurdles in place. And so I find it to be ironic that there's still those pushing this narrative, pushing this when we've had a decisive vote in the state of Kansas. And I wish we would just move on and focus on our, our business sides and our education per, uh, targets. All right, changing gears a little bit. This question from uh, Robert O'Rourke was specifically sent to you, uh, Dave, uh, so if you'll start and the others too can answer. 
It says, you were one of the sponsors of House Bill uh, 2729, enacting Kansas spe uh, spe Species Legal Tender Act and the Kansas uh, Bullion, Bullion gosh, uh, Depository Act, authorizing the state treasurer to approve electronic currencies backed by special legal tender and establish, administer, or contract for administration of bullion uh, depositories and allowing the state monies to be deposited in such bullion depositories and invested in the species legal tender. Uh, what need What need does this legislation address? Whoa. I hope you understand that. I, I do. Um, we talked to the state treasurer. I, I can tell you that this isn't going to be easy easy to implement. So it's, it's basically recognizing gold and silver as, as legal tender. Um, and I think to some degree, part of, part of my support for that is, is just in recognition. When you look at cryptocurrency and you look at the other currencies that are out there, there needs to be potentially the same level of, of interest in, in hard currency. So that's, that's the reason that I supported it. And I would tell you this, the path to victory on it, if there is a thing, and I'll just be honest with you, is incredibly hard, incredibly slow, and it would require the state to do a lot of things. But again, it, it's, it's an issue that when you take a look at um, particularly the, the divide between digital currencies and some of, the, some of the, what you hear proposals that's being done to track, um, whether it's a Venmo um, transaction and the, and the government's involvement in that, this, this is maybe on the other side of that. Let's take a look at, at hard currency um, that doesn't go down that digital route. So it's more philosophical than anything else. Again, I think the path to implementation is hard. If you talk to the state treasurer, he'll tell you the same thing. Um, but that, that's the reason why I supported it. Thank you. Please. Well, we could go back to the gold standard. Uh, I'm not saying that might not be a solid, but I will say this on my role in the financial institutions, we've done a lot of heavy work uh, and I just want to point a couple of things out. Sometimes it's not about some of these hard social issues. And sometimes there's work being done that we actually do it in a bipartisan way that's actually fantastic and phenomenal. And we've done some of that work this year. And I just want to point out, taking this question that has to do with gold standards to talk about the consumer credit code. This has not been touched in years because a lot of people feared what we would do with changing the interest rates. We did a huge rewrite of that. Um, and had about 40 different entities coming together, and we successfully made an update that for protections to our consumer credit. S small business financing, we updated that so that uh, we put some standards in place when to places like Merriweather's, they were borrowing on their point of sale system, and that's a, what they, it's an alternate form of financing these small businesses. There's uh, earned wage access, which allows companies to have a way to let their uh, employees borrow money on their paycheck that's better than payday loans. It's a dollar or three dollars in terms of that that uh, that that um, the borrowing fee is only about three dollars instead of the huge amounts of interest. And then we updated the financial transact transmission money transmission laws, uh, which hadn't been updated since 1973. You think about Venmo that was mentioned; it triggered. We've done a lot of work to update those things to come up with a modern society. So. You know, some of the stuff that we do does affect the things that are, are very political, but some of the core work, and I'm proud to be a part of it, when we put our minds together and work together, we can actually have a real, real change that helps our business environment and our, uh, our uh, economy out here. So thank you. So Ted, I'm, I'm not on the relevant committees and 700 bills get sponsored in the House every year. So I'm not going to be able to talk intelligently about what this bill does because it was never heard in committee and it never came to the floor. But what I will say is where this is coming from is from the crushing inflation that is just, I mean, in my neighborhood up in North Leavenworth, just hitting people so hard. Folks can't pay their bills. Folks can't put food on their table because everything costs, you know, two, three, four times more than it cost just three years ago. And, you know, I watch TV and I see him say that inflation's at 3%. Those people clearly do not shop at Price Chopper, okay? Because at Price Chopper, the prices are up a lot more than that. And it's unconscionable. It's unconscionable that while people are being crushed by this inflation, the governor would veto that bill and so many people, that tax bill that would have put money back in folks' pockets when they need it the most to address this crushing inflation. And it, it just, it's unconscionable to me that 
uh, you know, folks would say that that was a tax cut for the rich. You know, the numbers that I just quoted you, the 25,000 getting more in real dollars than 150,000. I took that off of Jeff's Facebook page. He has a, he has a graphic on his page with a chart. I took those numbers off of his Facebook page. That's those numbers are the numbers that the Democrats were using to show that it was a, uh, that it was a tax cut for the rich. So, I think that we need to, you know, I understand that these some of these bills come from a good place. You know, people worried that they're, they're, there's the silent tax on their savings and their income in the form of, or form of inflation. But I think the best way to combat inflation is to let you keep more of the money that you earn so that you can take care of your family. Okay, we only have a few minutes left, and uh, you've touched on it earlier on the LAVTR and uh, property taxes, uh, but it was the most uh, cited in the uh, audience questions. So uh, let me just read some of these and let you comment. Do you support LAVTR? Since the tax plan failed, how will you fund our LAVTR? The uh, state collected and kept. And then... Uh, Given that it's uh, passed as law, why does Kansas legislator not obey the law and, uh, since 2003? Let's start with that. Dave? That's a good question. Um, and I guess I would say this. I think everybody up here, in, including Representative Johnson who left, last year this actually came to a vote in, in the House Taxation Committee, and I voted to uh, restore LAVTR. So it hasn't come to the, uh, to the floor this year, although it's been introduced. Um, it hasn't come to either committee or the floor for debate. And I will, I will tell you, um, so that's the one thing, and, and to maybe unpack it a little bit more, before I was ready to go back to Topeka this year, I, I talked, I mentioned them before, uh, city officials in both Leavenworth and Lansing, and, and their, their answer is a little bit different because what the, it was either restore or, or repeal the statute. The statute hasn't been funded since 2002 or three, um, and there's a, and it's anecdotal maybe information, but what you hear uh, from one side, maybe not from the other, is that counties weren't using LAVTR to reduce property taxes. That is what you hear, and you hear it, um, and I think some, something more than anecdotally. Again, I go back to what our current people in, in Leavenworth and Lansing are saying, either do it or get rid of it. And so what happened this last week, there, what, there, since there's been a bill to um, restore LAVTR, one was introduced last week to suspend it or, to, or to, to get rid of it. I don't know if it will come to the floor for a vote. What I will do is I will continue to work for property tax relief. I think LAVTR can be a red herring in cases. It may or may not get a hearing. But I'm, at the end of the day, real property tax relief is what we're after, and we've got to get that. So thank you. Thank you. So with the deepest possible respect to some of the county commissioners that are here in the room, uh, they sent a letter out with your property tax bill, which is what kind of renewed this conversation. And frankly, it's a little misleading, and I'd like to talk to you about why. Um, I've, I've got a video on Facebook and YouTube that explains this in a lot more detail. And it's the most exciting thing that I've ever done on Facebook or YouTube. I actually do public math. And I'd have to cut it or anything. So I encourage you to watch it because it goes into a lot more detail on this. But LAVTR has not been paid for 20 years. Every year, we don't break the law. Every year, there's a budget proviso in the budget that says we're not going to pay this money. And the reason that the state never pays the money, and that happened long before any of the county commissioners or any of us were in government. Um, the reason they don't pay the money is because it won't stop the skyrocketing property taxes. Every year, your county raises your property taxes 15%, $4 million, right? If we spent a half billion dollars every year forever funding LAVTR, every year $4 million would come to the county. That would take care of the first year's increase. But then what happens next year? Because every year they raise the property taxes 15%, $4 million. What, we're not going to add $500 million every year. The state would be broke in three years. So... LAVTR is not the solution. The solution is the constitutional amendment that uh, Karen Tyson's uh, 
tax committee sponsored that has passed the Senate that I'm fighting like the, you know, the third monkey trying to get on the ark to get un pa passed on the House floor to cap valuations so that uh, your valuations can only go up 4% a year as, unless you sell your house or you do some kind of major construction on it. I think I already said this once, I'll say it again. I probably said it three times. I sponsored SB 196. It's the one that returns LAVTR to all our counties and cities as it should be. It restores it into the budget so that we're not taking that money from the local government. I'm telling you, there is a real fight against local governments up at state level. They feel like it's a slush fund, that it won't be used. But I'll tell you, every dollar that goes into the uh, county and city government helps reduce property tax needs. I don't feel like our city government nor our county is particularly wasteful in their spending. In fact, I feel like they've done a pretty good job. They've got limited resources with the property, uh, the, the properties that they have and the, the, the amount of land they have. What we need to do to help them is to a bring the LAVTR. It's not a silver bullet. It's a piece of the uh, piece of the pie. We need to increase our economic development and have more tax base in this town. We need to look at um, the constitution constitutional amendment that I sponsored, SCR 1604, that turned into 1611, that does give us tax certainty. Um, I think my, my, my position on this is pretty clear. I have not heard, unfortunately, any local government tell me that they want us to repeal that uh, from my own experience. Thank you so much. Right. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Uh, I'll give you each two minutes for your closing statements. Pat, would you start? Well, first of all, thank you, Ted. Thank you, Jen, for creating this forum. I think it's really important, and I think we had a great conversation. So it's an election year, folks, and um, you already got you got a preview of it tonight. There's going to be a lot of people on both sides of the aisle, Democrat and Republican, that are going to be trying to distract you with a whole bunch of hot button issues. We heard a few of them tonight. You know, transgender this or abortion that. You're going to be hearing it all election cycle. What I'd encourage you to do is focus, uh, I've got an opponent, I'd like you to focus on what I actually do for you. Okay, I'm in Topeka, I'm fighting for you. I'm, you know, I just co-sponsored two bills that are bipartisan. Uh, the fentanyl bill that got passed through the House, the, uh, the Good Samaritan Law expansion, uh, two Democrats, two Republicans. We came together, we got it done, because it's going to save kids in our town. Um, I just co-sponsored an AI bill uh, to... Uh, do something to address AI and campaigns and AI to deceive people is uh, how they vote. Um, I co-sponsored that with the minority leader of the House, uh, the, the head Democrat in the House. Um, I'm not focused on these hot button issues that you hear. I told you where I stand on them because you deserve to know because I'm your elected representative, but I'm not focused on those things. What I'm focused on is lowering your property taxes, I'm focused on keeping your family safe. I'm focused on standing with our veterans and our uh, corrections officers. I'm focused on bringing jobs and opportunity back to Kansas. And if you like that, and you like what I've done so far, and you want me to keep doing it, I'd be honored to have your vote to return. If you'd like to know what it is I'm doing day to day, um, I do a newsletter. It's out every week, the Proctor Report. Uh, it's not a great name, but it's a name. And uh, if you can get on Facebook or you can get on my website and click the sign up and you'll get a newsletter every week. I don't spam you. It's just what I'm doing in Topeka. Thank you. Please. So I'm going to attempt to stick the landing. Oh, that's different for sport. Um, so I'm going to go back to the, the football analogy and maybe try to get back to the intent of this, this forum tonight. We're here to talk about the legislative update, where we are uh, at turnaround. So last week in the House, I think I mentioned this, we passed 70 bills between the Speaker of the House and the, and the President of the Senate. Roughly 50 of those will be worked between now and the end of March. Um, a, lot of, a lot of work back and forth between committees. I think we're, we're 26 committees in the House. I don't even know how many is in the Senate. Um, but there's a lot of work between those committees that will happen between now and really the first part of April. That's when we have to get our work done. Um, there will be conference committees, um, committee meetings, debate on the floor, and again, as we talk about, uh, at the end of the day, we'll have to deliver a budget 
which will include, include funding for state education, and I fully expect and anticipate for the sixth consecutive year we will fully fund education. So that is, um, that's kind of where we are from that aspect. I've got one minute left, and, and what I would say is this, is I, uh, I, appreciate, I appreciate the opportunity to meet with people from the 40th District, whether it's via email, uh, phone calls, or pops it, pop into the Capitol. Um, I also have a newsletter. If you find my, my house email address, it comes from that account. I'm not as sophisticated as some of the ones that have the uh, constant contact or other ones, but it's an update of what's going on. What I will pledge to do is I'll answer your emails, I'll answer your calls, uh, and I'll work with you and try to give you a straight shot of, of what I'm working on. You deserve that. At the end of the day, for me, it's, it's working on things like the mental health intervention team. Um, I know Maggie Peterson, who's the, the social worker at Lansing Middle School. She's a year younger than my daughter. They played volleyball and softball together. We talked about mental health last year when she came to the Capitol, and that bill will help her and help Lansing if they choose to use that. So that's why I'm here, and uh, thank you much. Appreciate it. So my Facebook page is out there. It's followed by both Republicans and Democrats, apparently. I also have a newsletter. It's votepitman.com. You can sign up for it. If it gets too long, let me know. I, uh, I'm pretty thorough in there. You know, the other day I was looking at the Kansas Constitution, and I came across the phrase, all political power is inherent in the people. It's so important. It's the picture of that phrase is in the basement of the Capitol. Walk by it every day. And it struck me sometimes our legislature is controlled by a very few. And they push things. Um, forward. And sometimes you and I wouldn't agree with that. Sometimes my colleagues or myself get pushed in those directions and we lose sight of our people. And I think if we had referendum by the people, we would be working on different issues than we are today. I mean, we had that value them both referendum. If our leadership would listen to that, we wouldn't have all these bills getting pushed out. We had an incredibly popular Medicaid program that would help workforce, help with mental health, help the most needy and get our money back from those Californians and New Yorks, New Yorkians, I don't know what they're called. But we've neglected that due to our leadership. We have three to four states who have, we are three or three of, or four, uh, fourth in the nation who have not taken any action on marijuana. And our neighbor state in Missouri last year raked in over $1.3 billion, I believe is what I was told. Our legislature is a little out of touch and we can do better, we need some serious change. But even so, I do work on your behalf. I'm uniquely able to work in collaboration with my Republican colleagues, as well as the Democratic administration. I've been able to work with my colleagues on bipartisan bills, SB 131, SB 123, 132 last year that passed all the way through the process and became law, doing things like securing in-state tuition for military kids returning to Kansas, reduce, reducing liability for sports doctors, and bringing that impact aid back to, from uh, the federal government. This means good things for you, my constituents, because I believe we must focus on bipartisan solutions that can help our educate our kids that don't unfairly give uh, undue tax advantage to the most wealthy, but bring that property tax relief that we need so much and help us build our infrastructure needed to continue to grow as a state. Thank you, and may God bless our community, our great state, and this remarkable nation. Thank you so much for being here. All right, gentlemen. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. As I said, this is uh, from the uh, turnover, and we will ask them back in June. I believe it's June 8th, or first Monday in June, that we want to have the update on what did happen with the closure. So please come back to see us in then. Thank you so much for coming this evening. Thank you for the civil discourse that we've had. Would you please thank our legislators one more time? Have a good evening. What are you doing?